In this video, we're going to talk about a very interesting phenomena, rolling. And in particular, rolling without slipping, which means that the object will not slide while it rolls. The key thing to know about rolling without slipping is that an object that's doing this, that is undergoing rolling without slipping, is in pure rotation about an axis through an instantaneous point of contact with the floor. What does this mean? This means that there's a point where it touches the floor that you could think of it as if somebody put a shaft, a rod, right through the object and the object rotates altogether in pure rotation about that point. This is the key thing about understanding rotation. Now rather than working with a regular wheel which is complicated and keeps moving, we're going to start with the simplest type of shape. So one of the great developments of the wheel was when the wheel was developed it led to chariots and chariots provided a platform for an archer to set and shoot arrows at the enemy. And because it could be attached to a horse which could pull it at high speeds, the chariot could go through the enemy, shoot the enemy, turn around, come back, shoot again, and the people in the infantry couldn't really attack him or get to the archers. So it completely changed the power of the world and it changed which were the great nations. Now we're going to develop a chariot and we're going to develop actually much like what really happened. Chariots didn't start as nice round circular wheels. There was no rubber to rope to be able to mold wheels. What they had were sticks and they tied these sticks together and they made polygons. Now our polygon is going to be made by a group of physics students and they're going to build a three-sided equilateral polygon like shown. And this thing has three vertices I'm going to label as A, B, and C. And we're going to assume that this is the point of instantaneous rotation and this whole polygon, this triangle, is going to rotate about that point. And when it does, what's going to happen is point B is going to come over so it's going to go from A over to point B like this. Point C is going to go up like that to right here. And the key thing is the center mass where we put our axle, it's now moved over. So although we've done pure rotation, the axle and the chariot bed where the archer standing has got moved. Now the problem with this is it goes kaplunk, kaplunk, and it's going to bounce our archer and make him very inaccurate. So he's not going to be happy with this. But this is rolling without slipping. A pure rotation like this following about a single point. Now once this thing rotates, this point A is no longer going to be the point of instantaneous contact for the next rotation. That's going to be this point B. So now the whole thing is going to rotate about point B. So when it rotates about point B, B stays still, point C falls over, so it goes over like this, the point C. Point A now comes up, And again, our center of mass has moved over. And kaplunk, 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 our wheel goes down the road, as does our archer. Now, this bouncing up and down is because we're rotating a very large thing. It takes three t flips to go all the way around or make 360 degrees. So we're making more 120 degree rotation each time. And that's a big rotation and it's causing a large thud when we hit the ground. If we made more sides to our polygon, we could reduce this. So we get an improved physics design. And this one now has four-sided polygon called a rectangle, or in this case, they're equal sides, it's a square. So we're going to rotate again about our point A. So there's A, B, C, and point D. And we rotate around and what happens? Well B comes down, C goes over, and D goes up. 
Then we rotate about this. And we come over and C goes over. D goes over. And A goes up. And then we rotate and again our center of mass moves and this time we rotate by 90 degrees and that makes our bump a little less so it's a little better improved design not making it quite as unstable and we could continue this we could make it even better we could use a six-sided polygon and in here of course we'd have A B C D E and F and this side would come over and this side would go down and then it would come back up if I can do it right then it would go over over and down not a very good one but you get the idea in this case we're only rotating by 60 degrees and each time we put more sides we make the amount that we move the center mass smaller per rotation, but we make it also smoother. The idea is what's important, and that is there is a single point upon which we're in pure rotation. So I know the center mass is translating, moving sideways, but the object is actually a rotating object about this point right there, the instantaneous point of contact. which does not allow it to slide, has to stay stationary. And every other point are in rotate can be thought of as in rotation with some radius upon which their circle is going. Now, notice the modern wheel, an infinite sided polygon. Well, it turns out the Mesopotamian, the Samaria, Sumerians of Mesopotamia, when they invented the wheel several thousand years ago, didn't quite invent it that way. They had what looked to be somewhere around 10 sides, and there are some others I know that say they're 20-sided polygons that were flat. So our design of polygons isn't far off from what actually happened in actual, the real world, in history. Today, we make a circle, an infinite-sided polygon. In the wheel, there is a point of contact. This point does not slide. It's rolling without slipping. Every other point is seen to be in pure rotation about that point. Now, what does that mean? That means that this point right here at the center has a velocity v, the velocity of the center mass. It is related to the rotation omega times this distance, which is the radius. This point up here has a tangential velocity. I'll call that point A, maybe. That's related to omega, but its R of its circle is 2R. It's in pure rotation. The tangential velocity is the angular velocity times the distance to the axis of rotation. And this is the axis of rotation. If it's this point, that distance is r. If it's this point here, the distance is 2r. It is a purely rotating object about that point. What is happening, however, is that as the ball moves, let me draw the ball moving over again. As the ball moves, just as with the polygon, the point that's touching the surface, which could have been this point earlier, has fallen down and become the new point of rotation. And at that point, it doesn't move. Now, here's something else. Since it doesn't move or slide, even though there's friction here, The friction does no work because it has no displacement. 
so we don't tend to lose energy, at least if it was perfect, we wouldn't lose any energy in the fact that it's touching. Now, is any wheel really perfect? No, it deforms and has a slight slip, and consequently there's a little bit of heating, a little bit of energy loss at that point due to friction, but much less than, for instance, objects that slide along a plane. So this is another reason that we like wheels. So, again, let me go back and re-interface one more time. The object undergoing rolling without slipping is in pure rotation about an axis through an instantaneous point of contact with the floor. And that instantaneous point of contact shifts to different parts of the wheel as the wheel rolls. Now, as we've already shown, because of this, this velocity of the center mass is given by this omega r. Let me write that down. The velocity of the center of mass is equal to the angular velocity times r. This condition is called the no-slip condition. So the fact that it rotates and has an omega fixes the speed of this center of this ball rolling or this wheel. It can't just have any old value at once. If you speed up omega, you will speed up the speed at which it translates. If you slow down omega, you'll slow down the speed at which it translates. Now you may have a speedometer in your car. And in your car speedometer, you are measuring supposedly this. Let me tell you that's not what you're really measuring. What the speedometer is actually measuring is this, omega. And you have a certain tires on your car that have a certain R. And it assumes that this R is whatever was specified for your car. And it takes that R and multiplies the omega to put what your speed is up on your speedometer. If you have the wrong size tires, your speedometer is not reading correctly anymore. This happened to me one time when I borrowed my grandfather's truck and I was riding to a baseball game I was playing in in college. And on my way, I passed a cop near uh, Fairfield. And they I was making great time and I was going along. It seemed to be really good. And they started waving at me. I thought they'd been friendly, so I waved back. Well, it turns out they stopped me. They weren't waving. They were trying to tell me I was driving too fast. But my speedometer didn't say that, and fortunately they didn't give me a ticket. They noticed that my tires were the wrong size for that truck. So somebody put the wrong size tires on it. I thought I was going slower. And, of course, they gave me some interesting or good advice, which is if you're passing people in Texas, you know you're speeding because everybody in Texas speeds. All right, that finishes this section of rolling without slipping.